At Making Medicine, we're reporting on the headlines, not making medical recommendations. For personal health questions, always consult a doctor. Nothing in this episode constitutes investment, financial, or legal advice, and please consult your own advisors before making decisions. Hello, and welcome back to the Making Medicine podcast, where science, policy, and innovation meet. I'm your host, John Stanford. Today, as we close out the year, we're excited to share a year-in-review look at the 2025 biotech investment trends, the latest FDA approvals, and what Congress is doing as 2025 comes to a close. Let's dive in. Barring any last-minute surprises, this will be Congress's last week in Washington. So we'll start there and talk about how they plan to close out the year this week. First up, the House passed the FY 2026 NDAA, that defense bill we talked about on last week's episode, by a wide bipartisan margin. In the Senate, it looks good to clear with bipartisan votes there later this week. If you listened to last week's episode, you heard our deeper dive on the defense bill's biotech priorities. But the bottom line, and I do encourage you to take a listen, is that the NDAA makes clear that Congress is treating biotech as both an industrial capacity priority and a national security issue. It's going to be something we're talking about next year. Next, House leadership is teeing up a vote this week on a Republican health care package, branded the Lower Health Care Premiums for All Americans Act. We're recording this on Wednesday morning, so by the time you hear it, a vote may have already happened. So what is in the House Republican package? It's a mix of long-running priorities, things like expanding access to certain employer-sponsored options and association health plans, and it also includes provisions around PBM transparency. But without a solution to the ACA cliff, even if it does pass the House with just a few days left in the congressional calendar, it won't clear the Senate. The bottom line? The House is voting, but the bigger story is what isn't happening. There's no clear path right now to prevent premium spikes on January 1. That means health care policy is first up to be a key issue in 2026 and will likely be on tops of voters' minds come midterm elections as millions of Americans deal with higher premiums. That's less than a year away. Now let's talk PBMs. PBM reform has been the next up in Congress for what feels like forever. Strong bipartisan rhetoric, lots of hearings, lots of draft text reviewed by the Incubate team, but repeated failures to get these major reforms across the finish line. In fact, multiple efforts to move PBM reforms through must-pass vehicles have repeatedly bogged down or been stripped back, maybe most notably with last year's end-of-year continuing resolution. Against that backdrop, two pieces of legislation have gotten some renewed attention. First, the HELP Copays Act. The HELP Ensure Lower Patient Copays Act targets a very specific set of practices where patient assistance doesn't always count towards a patient's deductible or out-of-pocket maximum. It was introduced in the House by a bipartisan group of representatives and in the Senate earlier this year. Supporters frame this as a straightforward patient protection move. If a patient has copay assistance, it should reduce what they pay at the pharmacy counter, not get captured by PBMs. Second, the PBM Price Transparency and Accountability Act, introduced earlier this month by Senators Wyden and Crapo. It focuses heavily on Medicaid and Medicare mechanics, preventing abuses across spread pricing in Medicaid, improving payment accuracy, and increasing PBM accountability. All of this is a lot of words, covering PBMs which we have talked about tirelessly. In fact, I was pretty stunned in the midst of presidential debates that the acronym PBM made the news. So it's clear that efforts to call attention to the price-gouging middlemen that seem to constantly avoid legislative reform, it's clear that it's broken through, but nothing has gotten done. So what should you listeners take away? Congress keeps circling PBM reform because there's broad agreement that the system is too opaque and incentives are misaligned. But getting a package enacted remains hard, especially when reforms get tied up in bigger health care and budget fights. In the near term, PBM provisions are increasingly being folded into legislative vehicles, including the House health care debate we just talked about. And before we get into our version of 2025 wrapped, as far as investment goes, one last quick policy update relevant to Incubate and a bill that we've been pushing. The House passed and we celebrated 
the INVEST Act, or the Incentivizing New Ventures and Economic Strength Through Capital Formation Act of 2025. It had a strong bipartisan vote, 302 to 123. The bill heads over to the Senate, where its future remains unclear, but we'll be pushing to have it taken quickly because it has a meaningful impact on early-stage biotechs trying to access both private and public capital. What does the bill do? First, there'll be less friction in early fundraising because the act includes practical updates that make it easier for founders to raise money without tripping wires, like clarifying that pitches at certain sponsored events aren't automatically treated as a general solicitation and raising the crowdfunding threshold that triggers costly accountant reviews. Second, it gives a clear runway to IPOs and staying public. On public markets, the bill aims to make going public less burdensome for growth companies, reducing financial history required in the initial EGC filings from three years to two, expanding access to confidential draft submissions, and making, quote, testing the waters available to all issuers. The bottom line, for innovative pre-revenue biotechs, the package is designed to widen the funnel of early capital and lower the costs and friction of eventually accessing public markets. It's exactly the kinds of changes that can matter when capital is tight and timelines are long. Incubate was proud to support House passage and looks forward to engaging with senators to get it over the finish line. It's not sexy stuff, to be sure, and it doesn't make a lot of headlines. But lessening the barriers for getting companies to access public markets could help with the slowdown that we've had over the last half decade. Before we close, I want to share a quick sneak peek at some of the 2025 biotech investment data we'll be releasing in much more detail in January through our Incubate Policy Lab. Here are some big numbers that show that biotech had a good year despite uncertainty and policy headwinds at times slowing us down. From January through November, we tracked 752 investments into early stage biotechs, totaling about 16.5 billion in venture capital. With regards to specific therapeutic areas, a few themes jumped out. Oncology remains on top with more than 200 deals, representing roughly $4.2 billion. Neurology and immunology each drew a little under $2 billion. And lastly, rare diseases with orphan drugs saw more than 50 investments, totaling around $1.7 billion. We've seen an uptick in rare disease investments following the passage of the big, beautiful bill in July. It's a real-world example of how policy can shape incentives. Congress fixed one of the major flaws of the IRA, and we're already seeing dollars come back into the system. Geographically, there were no surprises on the top states, but the numbers are striking. California had 221 deals, about $6.1 billion, and Massachusetts had just shy of 150 deals, representing roughly $4.6 billion. But there was a strong showing from other states that round out our top five. New York had 44 deals with $445 million, Pennsylvania with 35 deals representing $440 million, and Texas with 34 deals that pulled in a whopping $1.1 billion. Congratulations to Texas for breaking the billion-dollar threshold for investment in early-stage biotech. Being the political wonky nerds we are, we also had to break this down by congressional house districts. And it's obvious that some members sit on enormous concentrations of innovation. We would expect these members to also therefore be champions for life science policy. Representative Ayanna Presley's district leads by deal count with 68 investments totaling more than $2 billion. Kevin Mullen in California, just outside of San Francisco, had 61 deals, nearly $3 billion investment. Catherine Clark in Massachusetts, who's also in the leadership of the Democratic Party, had 31 deals with just over a billion dollars invested. Nancy Pelosi, the former Speaker of the House who has announced her retirement, had 35 deals, just over 600 million. And Scott Peters down in San Diego had 24 investments with also just over $600 million. One last data point that we're gonna look forward to digging deeper in in the official Incubate Policy Lab report on this AI-enabled biotech is real, not hype. We caught an interesting trend in investments as the year progressed. 144 investments, to be exact, into companies that are utilizing AI in drug discovery and development, totaling about $3 billion so far this year. We'll have a full breakdown early next year, and this will certainly be something we're talking about at our event 
at JP Morgan's conference in January. Lastly, for this episode, we always like to end on a positive note, and it's time for our FDA approvals corner. For all the noise in policy and politics and debates over healthcare, the point of all of this work is simple. New treatments, reaching patients who need them. So we'll take a quick spin through what was announced in November, and we love celebrating the wins that represent years, if not decades, of scientific effort, clinical trial participation, and perseverance across the ecosystem. Not to mention, of course, the risk capital that makes it all possible. Voizact, developed by Otsuka, was approved November 25th for kidney disease. Hirenuo, developed by Bayer, was approved November 19th to treat certain non-small cell lung cancers. Redemplo, developed by Arrowhead Pharmaceuticals, was approved a day before, November 18th, to reduce triglycerides in adults with a disorder where the body can't break down dietary fats. Come Zifty, developed by Cora Oncology, was approved November 13th to treat adults with relapsed or refractory acute myeloid leukemia. And finally, Kijevi, developed by UCB, was approved November 3rd to treat thymidine kinase 2 deficiency in patients who start to show symptoms when they are 12 years or younger. I'm particularly encouraged by the last one because pediatric trials and pediatric drug development can be so complicated. We should always celebrate just a little bit more for drugs that help the youngest patients. That's our approvals corner for the month. Five reminders that innovation is moving and that progress is real even when the headlines are messy. We'll keep tracking the policy, but we'll always make time to celebrate what matters most. New options, new hope, and better outcomes for patients and families. That wraps up this year in review episode of the Making Medicine podcast. If you have thoughts on the 2025 investment data or the FDA approvals we covered today, drop us a comment and we may feature it in an upcoming episode. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube and follow us on LinkedIn, X, and Instagram using the links in the description. Thanks for listening. Happy holidays. And as always, keep innovating. Thank you.